everyone. Um, I am Vinita Blessing. I teach in world languages and cultures, um, German and French. Um, and I, uh, I'm actually trained as a historian, so I'm a little bit of a, I'm a kind of a spy over there, I guess you might say. I am thrilled to welcome you to the first evening of the Holocaust Memorial Week. Um, we've been working on this program since last April. And we're very, very excited to share with you. I'm especially happy to see some of my students in the audience. Thank you for believing me that this is a thing we really should show up for. Um, we have a few people and groups to thank for their sponsorship. The Pan-Hellenic Council, the Interfraternity Council, Resident Housing Association, the Oregon Historical Society, but I am City of Corvallis, College of Liberal Arts, the Center for the Humanities, um, Schiffer, which is a, a school of history, philosophy, and religion, for those of you not in the abbreviation mode here, and uh, OSU Student Affairs, and the OSU, uh, OSU Provost Fund for Excellence. Um, and we have a number of individual donations, and um, while I'm at that, if you are interested in um, supporting this uh, Holocaust Memorial Week now and in the future, we have a convenient uh, donation box for you in the back with lovely cards, easy to fill out, and we won't lose your address if you give it to us, we'll track you down. Um, it would be lovely um, for that kind of support from you. Um, this really is a, an event about the community and about our students, so um, um, welcome everybody and thank you so much. I have a few words to say about our speaker. Um, uh, Dr. Randall Bike work did tell me I should keep it really super, super short. Um, I will, but I have a couple things I want to say about him. He's an important person in my life, although you might not have known it, um, while I was um, first becoming a professor. Um, he did his BA at Calvin College, his master's at Northwestern University, and he stayed there for his PhD at Northwestern University. He was careful to tell us at a luncheon with students earlier today that he so graciously um, agreed to work with us, with them, and talk a little bit about his own journey, um, that he actually is not an historian, that he does rhetoric, um, but we in the historical community have always welcomed him as one of our own. Um, uh, he, uh, he started his career after Northwestern at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Um, that's where my family is from, so it's always amusing to think about where they might have crossed and managed to be lucky enough to wind back at Calvin College, where he had done his BA. Um, I think many of us can appreciate what a special kind of thing that is. He's the author of numerous articles and books, including a biography of Julia Streicher, one of the most anti-Semitic of the anti-Semitic Nazi um, program of uh, movement. And that book is available for sale for $10 at the back um, after this is all over, and uh, you can have your copy signed, um, and a uh, nice opportunity for us there. Thank you so much. Um, and his most recent book is Bending Spines, the Propaganda of Nazi Germany and the German Democratic Republic, which we learned today has been uh, in our lunch and has been translated into a few other languages as well. Um, this is truly an international scholar. Um, Thank you so much for coming to our student meeting today. We learned a little bit more about his um, the crazy way that things happen to you and you become all of a sudden a renowned historian, even if you're not a historian, of, uh, uh, for propaganda and dictatorships. Um, that's the most I want to say about him uh, from his uh, CV. I do want to say that I was so excited when I saw that we were going to be able to invite him and I've had my fingers crossed that it was going to work out at the very last minute making sure I could actually see him. I, uh, we hosted him for dinner at my house um, just now and uh, it was a real honor. Um, I was a new assistant professor at Ohio University uh, many, many years ago and inherited courses called Hitler German, Hitler's Germany and um, Nazis and other fascists and I didn't really know what to do with those courses as a new assistant professor. And um, Dr. Lightwork's uh, website um, through Calvin College on propaganda, which started out primarily as a Nazi propaganda internet archive and has become one that includes also much information on the German Democratic Republic, was a real lifesaver for me. I, he's been in that way a bit of a, um, 
a mentor, perhaps, for how to find primary sources for students. As recently as um, this past quarter, I used his website again, encouraging students to look at primary documents, which he so graciously um, puts excerpts of and, and translates them. So he's a true, um, I think for me, especially the best kind of Holocaust educator, um, which is to acknowledge what has happened in the past and then be able to reach out and ask, what now? And one of those what now pieces is education. Um, so I appreciate that kind of um, dedication to students and their learning. So um, I think I'm going to the title of this right. Um, it's uh, Building, Hat Building Hatred from a Firm Foundation, Anti-Semitic Propaganda in Nazi Germany. And uh, with that, I will turn you over to our expert. Thank you so much. In the mid-1920s, when Hitler was in jail, he wrote Mein Kampf. And in Mein Kampf, among many other remarkable things he says, he says, if at the beginning of World War I and during the war, 12 or 15 thousands of these Hebrew corruptors of the people had been held under poison gas, as happened to hundreds of thousands of our very best German workers in the field, the sacrifice of millions at the front would not have been in vain. On the contrary, 12,000 scoundrels eliminated in time might have saved the lives of a million real Germans. Now, when this was published in the 1920s, nobody foresaw the Holocaust. I don't think the Nazis did. I don't think they were ready for it themselves. But this statement makes it clear that at the very beginning of Nazism, there was at least the idea of killing Jews in large numbers. 12 to 15,000 is fairly significant, but of course Nazi ambitions grew with time. This evening we're going to look at a kind of propaganda pornography. What was it that persuaded Germans to either accept tacitly, to close their eyes, or in smaller numbers to actively participate in killing the Jews? Part of the reason, only part of the reason, the Holocaust is a complicated matter, but part of it was the propaganda, part of which we're going to see this evening, which helped shift the opinions of the Nazis themselves and, of course, of the larger German population. Now, what we're going to do is look at a lot of the work of this gentleman, Julius Streicher, who was probably one of the most unpleasant of the Nazis, and, of course, there were a lot of very unpleasant Nazis. He stands out among the crowd. He was an early supporter of Adolf Hitler, one of the few people on intimate terms with Hitler, in part because he had joined his forces, his personal following, to Hitler's in 1922, almost doubling the size of the Nazi party at the time. And that earned Hitler's lifelong gratitude. Now, Stryker, over the course of his career, and the Nazis in general, made three basic arguments about the Jews. First, the Jews were different than their Aryan, to use the preferred term, counterparts. Second, that those differences made Jews dangerous. Third, that something ought to be done about it. We will take up each of those in turn. The first argument, Jews were different. Here, for example, we have from one of the Nazi children's books. This was used in the schools, published in large editions. A comparison of your typical uh, Jew and your typical German. The German, of course, is tall, handsome, hardworking. Uh, the Jew is fat, slouching, a rather unsavory looking character. Or here we have from Stryker's newspaper, Der Sturmer, which for 20 some years was devoted entirely to rousing hatred against the Jews. Every issue carried material like this. This one says, and they maintain that they are God's chosen people. The caption says, according to official statistics, Jews have the greatest percentage of mental illness of any group on the planet. Or here we have what natural nobility speaks from the face of this German girl and what devilish depravity is mirrored in the face of this Jewish trash. This material, week after week after week after week, was repeated. And of course, not only in Stryker's newspaper, it was part of the public face of the Third Reich as well. 
I'm using Stryker because he was perhaps one of the more extreme versions, but he was not an outlier in Hitler's Third Reich. Sometimes, in fact, the Jews are so bad you could not even compare them to human beings. Here, for example, the cover of one of the children's books, a Jews are presented as toadstools, the poisonous mushroom. Again, this material was used in the schools. Or here we have the Jew as a vampire, dripping venom across the planet. Stryker's newspaper, by the way, had a circulation as high as 500,000 copies a week during the Third Reich. And as we'll see later, even if you didn't buy it, there were display cases all over Germany, which, which new issue was posted. This was part, this would be the equivalent in the United States of two or three million copies a week. Okay, this was not a minor periodical. Here we have the Jew as a spider. Now, why were the Jews so bad from the Nazi point of view? And there were a couple of reasons. The Nazis, of course, used the kind of pseudo-scientific racism that developed in the course of the 18th and 19th, uh, 19th centuries. And according to that, there are various versions. Some were proclaimed by distinguished professors with PhDs, and others cruder by the likes of Julie Stryker. But the argument was that there were, this is the crudest of Julie Stryker's version. There were basically three pure races in the world. The best, of course, was the Aryan uh, Germanic race. Then you had the Oriental race, which wasn't quite as good, but it was a pure race, and they were a very good race as long as they stayed in Asia. Then you had the blacks. Now, the blacks were an inferior race, but at least they were a pure race, and they had every right to stay in Africa where God or whatever the Nazis believed in had put them, okay? So you had these three pure races. Where did the Jews come in? According to the ideology, the Jews were the result of mixing the pure races. And, well, the Nazis would say, look, if you've got a purebred dog, that's worth something. If you've got a mongrel, a mutt, it's not worth anything. The bad characteristics come to the fore. And the argument was the same. The Jews were the inheritors of all of the bad characteristics of humanity and not the good ones. This is a rather dubious theory of biology, and I suspect it's not taught very often at Oregon State University in the biology department, but it had all kinds of proponents in the Third Reich. The second version of anti-Semitism was the religious argument, taking apart the long tradition of anti-Semitism in, in Europe. And according to that, of course, the Jews had the wrong religion. They had killed Christ, they refused to accept them, the Messiah, and so forth. And the Nazis used both of them, and we'll see examples of that as we go along. So here we have the Jew as a spider. But sometimes the Jews were seen as so bad you couldn't even pursue, I mean, at least a spider was a form of life, a natural form of life. The Jews were sometimes viewed as so bad that you could only compare them to the devil himself. And that is where that long tradition of religious anti-Semitism comes into play. This is a cover of the Stormer from the middle of the war, 1943. And, oops, sorry about that. Get the right button. You're supposed to be doing that. Yes. Yeah, there we go. This is very dim. OK, well, the laser pointer isn't bright enough. That's OK. We can do without it. It's clear enough. Uh, the caption is titled Satan. And that was meant in almost a religious, literal sense. Now, the Nazis were able to draw on a long tradition of European anti-Semitism, which had faded somewhat until the Nazis chose to use that as well as everything else. So here, for example, for one of the children's books again. This is used in the schools, kids 8, 10, 12 years old. What we have here is the rabbi teaching his young pupil about the Gentiles. And it says in the Talmud it is written, only the Jew is a human being. Gentiles are not people, but animals. Now, now, now think about this, okay? Think about what we just said. The Jews were spiders, animals, and so forth. But they had the gall to think that the Gentiles are the real animals. What a perversion of the true nature of things from the Nazi point of view. And so we have a lot of this kind of religious anti-Semitism that the Nazis were bringing back as well. Well, so the Jews were bad stuff. They had bad genes. They had a bad background. They were the exemplar of everything that was wrong with humanity. They were different. Now, that's bad enough. As human beings, we have a tendency to be suspicious of those who are different than us. And we certainly have enough evidence of that today. But the next step 
The second one was to argue that not only were Jews different, that difference made Jews dangerous. Now, the Nazis picked on traditional anti-Semitic themes. This is the cover again for one of Julius Stryker's newspapers, published in a huge edition and visible all over the country. The Economy and the Jews. This is from 1937. And what we have here is the traditional notion of the Jews as exploiting, as usurers, as interest gatherers, as all kinds of things, right? If you look here, you've got the star. Come on. Bingo. OK. You've got, that's really not good for anything. OK, well, you can see it. You've got the percentage sign of interest. OK, you've got the Star of David carved on the monster's uh, chest. You've got his claws on the planet, the English pound sign, the dollar sign uh, carved in his arm. This is the fairly traditional kind of anti-Semitism that had been around a long time, and the Nazis didn't hesitate to use it. Or here we've got a Jew worshiping a sack of money. The sole goal of the Jews is to amass as much as possible. This, again, is fairly traditional anti-Semitism, obnoxious though it might be. Children's books versus the German stock exchange. Uh, the Jew won't rest until they can sit on the biggest sack of money in the world. Okay? We've seen all of this in a lot of his times over the course of history. Or a final example, carriers of disease. Note the biologic metaphor. Jews are bad stuff. And here you're looking at a microscope slide, and you've got the symbols of the supposed international Jewish conspiracy. Jews are bad. But the Nazis, if they made a contribution to anti-Semitism, it was to make it very, very specific. So here we have, for example, a cartoon from the cover of the Stormer. And the Jewish butcher, as you can see, and his rather ugly wife, is grinding a rat to make the hamburger. And the caption says today, first rate hash, very cheap. Now, you might say, who could believe such a thing? Why would people believe it? Well, guess what? And I think it's easier to believe now as we watch what circulates on the internet. People believe things if it is sympath you know, in sympathy with their existing attitudes. We look for reinforcement about what we believe. Let me give you an example. How many of you have heard rumors about what McDonald's hamburger is made of besides beef? Anybody heard any examples? What do you hear? Rats. Rats, OK. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, OK, pink goo. Anything else? Ah, there are lots of other ones. My favorite, my absolute favorite, was the rumor, which was actually fairly widespread years back, was that they used ground up earthworms to make hamburgers. McDonald's, by the way, had a great response to that. I said, do you know how much earthworms cost? <laughs> but, but here's the point. You do not have to believe that McDonald's is selling chicken goo or earthworms, you don't have to believe it. If you believe, ten, if you believe it might be true, whether there's smoke this fire, you might be inclined to go to Burger King instead, right? You don't have to believe all of it. You don't even have to believe most of it. And what happens? You move a little bit forward and a little bit forward. And this is what the, you know, nobody is supporting this besides the rumors. In the case of the Third Reich, this is being purported supported not only by Julius Stryker, but by the educational system, by teachers, by the universities, by all the media. Okay? And so if we can believe that McDonald's is selling earthworms as hamburger, it perhaps becomes less surprising that Germans might begin to believe some of this. Because you see, typically our attitudes don't change overnight. They do sometimes, but not very often. We change gradually. And what the Nazis are interested in is moving people step by step by step. This kind of material would contribute to that. This is from the children's book. Again, kids, what have you got? You've got the filthy German, a Jewish butcher uh, stepping on a piece of meat. The story says that's all right. It weighs more in the scales that way. There's a filthy cat prowling in the background. And this stupid German woman and her ignorant son are buying this filth from this Jew, is basically what the story says. Him and kids at a very susceptible and early age. Here you've got, uh, look at the smirk on the face of this uh, Jewish livestock dealer hauling off the farmer's livestock. He's looking at a few coins in his hand. Stryker, by the way, had a 
nefariously gifted cartoonist who did most of these kinds of things, who developed a caricature, the Stormer Jew was widely known. You know, it was the worst possible image of the Jew repeated over and over and over and over again. We're moved by images. We're moved by images. The worm. The story says here, if something is rotten, the Jew is the cause. And you go into the rotten fruit, and there's the Jewish worm. Now, the point is that this is being made very, very specifically uh, by street and house number, OK? Because the Nazis wanted to make people clear on the fact that Jews were not only this vague, distant threat, they were an immediate threat. Every Jew, the next door neighbor, who looked innocent, was nonetheless dangerous because that Jew was the inheritor of all of humanity's evil characteristics. Now this tends to work rather effectively over time. Again, nobody is disagreeing. Disagree. Piece by piece by piece, negative piece by negative piece, the structure of anti-Semitism is built. Now, this also becomes vivid. I mean, this is vivid material. We're struck by that. Okay. Um, okay. Who's got a dog? Dog. I, some, some, okay. A dog. Okay. I want you to imagine that you're sitting on the front steps of a family mansion some night, and the headline says, "Huge earthquake in China. Twelve million people dead. Biggest disaster in the history of humanity." You got that? And at the same time, your pet dog runs across the street and is hit and killed by a passing red pickup truck. What causes you more grief? What kind of person is she? <laughs> 12 million people are dead, and she's worried about her dog. Would any of us respond differently? Now, let's, let's try a different step. The same headline, the dog is still lying dead in the middle of the street by the red pickup. But you've got a brother or a sister who's teaching English in Beijing. Now what happens? Now you're worried about your sister. I don't know if it's true or not, but it should be if it isn't. Joseph Stalin is reported to have said, a single death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. We don't cry about statistics. We don't get as angry about statistics. But that dead dog in the middle. Well, you see what the Nazis are trying to do? They're trying to present the individual Jew everywhere as evil, as bad, okay? Not this, they're interested in this broad Jewish conspiracy, but they're also interested in pointing out every individual Jew as evil, as a threat, of making it vivid. If there was a contribution Nazis made to anti-Semitism, uh, that may have been it. Well, still on the topic of, of Jews being dangerous, uh, the, other, uh, the next thing that Jews did, according to Nazi ideology, was to attempt to destroy the purity of the German race. Now, the Jews, according to Nazi ideology, were the inheritors of everything wrong with humanity. They were cowards and all of the rest. But they had the supposed campaign to take over the world. How were they going to do that? One way was to corrupt the purity of the German race. Because by the Nazi argument, and Stryker literally said this, a single incident of sexual intercourse between a Jew and a German woman was enough to forever poison the German woman's blood. Her very genetic structure would be changed somehow. Stryker would tell stories to kids, I mean school groups, that would go like this. Well, there was this German girl, she wasn't very bright, I'm afraid, and she married a Jew. Well, she got pregnant. And she was in the hospital, the baby was brought to her, and she burst out into tears when she saw it. Because you know what it was? A little Jewish monkey, a ah, Jewish bastard, if you prefer. Well, this taught the woman something, and so she divorced her Jewish husband. But she married a good stormtrooper without telling him that she'd been married to a Jew. And lo and behold, she got pregnant again, and the baby was brought to her again. And you know what this one was? Another Jewish monkey. Now, again, on the one hand, this is biological nonsense, right? but it was consistent with the overarching flow of Nazi propaganda and told to kids. So Stryker's newspaper had the mock, he was, he was given the mocking title by Germans of the National Pornographer of the Third Reich because as often as possible he printed Jewish sexual scandals and accusations 
Now, of course, every now and then, there was a Jew who was a rapist. But the Nazis took the most ridiculous rumor and spread, and, and he went into tremendous detail. Parents used to try to keep the Sturmer out of the hands of their kids. It was kind of the equivalent of an uncensored internet connection for a 14-year-old a day, right? Who knows what you'll find? Well, you could get a pretty good sex education and perversion from reading Stryker's uh, Der Sturmer. Here we have racial defilement. You've got an ugly Jew with his arms around this comely German lass, and uh, he seduced her through alcohol. Here you've got death in the background playing its fiddle while this woman is lured by uh, jewels. This material was repeated over and over and over again. Here's the children's books. Okay? Again, this is ancient children. So you've got the ugly Jew with his arms around this lovely woman. Uh, the German kids to the right, they've heard about Jews in the school, and they know how bad this is. The kid to the left with a smirk, he's a Jewish boy, the story says, and he's not old enough to do this himself yet, but he can't wait until he can take this German girl up to his room too. And remember, that destroys the purity of the race, and they might never again be able to bear healthy German children, or even if they didn't buy Stryker's peculiar version of genetic corruption, nonetheless, the offspring would be Jewish and characteristic of all of the bad stuff. Children's book. Story here is this girl is told to go to a Jewish doctor. She doesn't want her. Her mother says, go. The obedient German girl, she does. She hears a scream from behind. Doctor, no, please, no! And then silence. And then we have this scene. The door opens. And she sees the ugly face. She runs screaming from the office. And it turns out it's a good thing uh, because he's been drugging and raping his female patients. Now, there were, as I, this is a kind of propaganda pornography, as I said at the beginning. But this was repeated over and over and over and over again until it became part of the public presence of the Third Reich. But it was worse than that. Not only were the Jews engaged in various corruption, uh, not only in economic crimes, not only in seducing German womanhood, they were killing Germans to secure their blood. The Nazis revived the medieval legends of ritual murder according to which Jews needed the blood of freshly slaughtered Christians uh, to use in religious rituals. Displays something of a ignorance of the moral code of Deuteronomy, among other things, but that didn't concern the Nazis too much. Now, this was a hard thing for the, even the Nazis to get back. This had kind of died out. It was widely believed in the Middle Ages, but then kind of died out. So the first step the Nazis took was to argue that kosher slaughter was particularly cruel. So here we have two German kids up in the corner, and they're looking in the window at the Jewish slaughterhouse where this animal is being bled to death, and the Jews enjoy it. They take pleasure in seeing an animal die in agony, is the argument. Now, if that's the way they treat animals, and if Gentiles are no better than animals, you'd expect them to do the same thing to Gentiles, right? And this is probably the cover of the most notorious issue of the Stormer, the 1934 ritual murder edition. Jewish murder plan against Gentile humanity discovered. Victims of the Jews. And you can see that there's a bunch of heads upside down. Their throats have been slit. The Jews are collecting the blood on a plate. And in a religious metaphor, you've got the three crosses of Calvary in the background. This, by the way, was a little beyond what even the Nazis could take. And the issue was actually banned by the Nazi government, not because of the anti-Semitic content, but because of a line which said that the Jewish Ritual murder was kind of similar to the Christian sacrament of communion. The only difference is that the Jews was physical blood, and that was an offense against religion. And so the issue was withdrawn from circulation, not because of the anti-Semitic content. Now, it'd be nice to believe that, of course, this died of the Nazis. Uh, but pre-internet days, this particular publication appeared, the Christian Vanguard, uh, the Julius Schreiker Memorial Edition, which translated into uh, English. and by the way, this kind of material is still widely available. Now, as Benita mentioned, I have a website which has a large amount of material, and I've written on the topic, and every now and then the wrong people look at it. So some years back, I was looking at the website, and I saw the martyrdom of Julius Stryker. He was just executed in Nuremberg for free speech. As I read that, it was somewhat familiar. In fact, it was. It was, some of it was my stuff. i have been plagiarized by neo-Nazis. Now, what do you do? Send them a letter saying, please give me credit? 
Anyway, uh, the point is that every now and then I have to deal with stuff uh, like that. Children's books. Kids, you got to come with me, but I got something sweet, but you got to come with me. And the story explains the kids have the good sense not to do this because, of course, he's been collecting children to butcher for use in Jewish religious rituals. Now, again, as I said, you might say, how can one believe this? But repeat it over and over and over and over and over again. And not having to believe all of it. If you believe there's a 15% chance of this happening, you're still rather distressed. But not only were the Jews committing economic crimes, not only were they trying to destroy the purity of German womanhood, not only were they killing innocent Germans for their blood, they were engaged in a campaign, the old Jewish world conspiracy theory, to take over the whole planet and subject it to Jewish interests. So, for instance, here from 1936, you've got a cartoon in which basically what's happening is the Jews are developing, uh, gobbling up all of the peoples of the world. It says, the Jews just don't want to rule Germany. They want to take over the whole world and devour all of the peoples of the planet. Here we have, you know, world criminals from the very beginning. And this goes back to the uh, famous, infamous perhaps, protocols of the learned elders of Zion which many of you all know is a kind of a forger of the Russian secret police and supposedly has the minutes of the world Jewish plot to take over the planet. It's got some strange things in it. Among other things, one thing to do was to plant a huge amounts of explosives in subway tunnels and then the Jews would threaten to blow up London from beneath unless uh, uh, there's even more ridiculous stuff than that. But in any event, uh, the Nazis were quite willing to use that argument. Here we have the Jewish war guilt. The profile of the war, the ugly Jewish silhouette and the German soldier. It was a war of the Jews against uh, the Germans. The bacterium, note the biological metaphor again, the bacterium. The Jews are a bad form of life. And you've got Jews lighting the world on fire. You've got Freemasonry. The Jews didn't like the Freemasons. Uh, plutocracy and Bolshevism. Now, now, you might say, well, what do you mean? How can the Jews be behind both capitalism and communism? To which the Nazi response would be, that only shows how much you've been deceived, deceived by the Jews. They're behind both of them. After all, Karl Marx was a Jew, the son of a rabbi. Many of the early uh, Marxists were Jews. And think of the great Jewish bankers, the Rothschilds, the Cohns, the Warburgs, and so forth. Uh, the Jews behind both of them. And besides that, these supposed mortal enemies would join together to fight National Socialist Germany, the only power willing to oppose the Jews. What more proof could you want than that? In the sign of Jehovah, Washington, London, Moscow, or the bloodbath, the Jews supposedly are making their fortune while the rest of the world's peoples uh, bleed to death. These are again all wartime uh, cartoons. So the Jews were engaged in a sinister conspiracy, doing all kinds of terrible things. That gets us to our third point. Jews are different. Jews are dangerous. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? Well, the first thing you do is hate Jews. This is a cartoon from 1943, and the headline in red says, the holy hate, the holy hate a kind of religious em you know, emphasis again. And the goal of the Sturmer is to present the evils of the Jews, not only to all Germans, but to the whole planet. And this meant, by the way, every last Jew. This was necessary because the Nazis were interested in what they called total solutions. And here, here's the problem. If most Jews are bad, but some are decent, there's a few decent Jews. The Nazis hated the decent Jew argument because that meant that you had to investigate each Jew individually, okay? That takes time. If the Nazis could argue that every last Jew was evil by virtue of the fact that he or she was Jewish, it made things a whole lot simpler. And so they had to argue that every last Jew was evil. So here we're from the children's books. You've got um, some of you have European backgrounds. I don't know, anybody go out mushroom gathering as a kid, you know, you're in the, the woods. Uh, so here you've got the young kid and his mother out picking mushrooms. And the kid comes to his mom and says, Mom, look at this, I found a good one, I found a good one. 
and his mother looks at it and says, uh, my son, this is actually a deadly toadstool. It would kill you if you ate it. It looks a lot like a safe mushroom, but it's deadly poison. So far, so good. Uh, but now she turns it into a lesson on racial biology. She says, my son, it is exactly the same with the Jews. Some Jews look safe. Some Jews masquerade as innocent. But inside, each and every Jew is like this toadstool, deadly to the German people. You see, that was absolutely necessary as an argument, because otherwise you had to do it case by case. The Nazis weren't interested in doing it case by case. They were interested in total uh, solutions. What about Christians? There were significant numbers of Jews who had been members of the Christian church for generations. Well, that's what this issue takes up. The Jews were incapable of being Christian, according to Nazi ideology. Oh, of course they could be baptized. Of course they could go to church. But they would do it only to conceal their real wickedness. They were spiritually incapable of perceiving the great truths of Christianity. So Christian Jew, that was a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron. Impossible, even if they looked that way. And the same was true in all kinds of areas. The Nazis regularly made arguments like everybody thought the Jewish doctor so-and-so was a, quote, decent Jew until it turned out he'd been drugging and raping his female patients. They could not allow the possibility of a single decent Jew without making their task of mass annihilation a whole lot different. So you hate Jews, all of them. And of course, you educate kids. This is a school scene, children's books, and the kid is repeating the lesson to the proud view of the teacher. Another children's book. Note the German schoolmaster in white in the background. He's looking on happily as his students are tormenting and teasing the uh, Jewish schoolmaster and his kids. You know, Jules crying, hair is being pulled. But that's okay, kids are told. These are Jews. They're not human beings. There was a great deal. And the Nazis realized, by the way, that they could not overnight they know it took time to persuade people. So you start early. You get kids and teach them from the earliest age how evil uh, Jews are. I mentioned before that you didn't have to buy the Sturmer to read it. So for instance, there were display cases of tens of thousands of them all over Germany. Stryker didn't build these. Rather, his loyal readers would build them and then buy a couple of copies of the Sturmer so that all the pages would be visible. These were put in public parks, factories, schools, and so forth. And it gave something to do to his most loyal followers. And of course, there were boycotts. Uh, there were three basic things the Nazis could do about the Jews. The first, they could make life as difficult as possible. That's what we see here. Second, you could get them to leave the country. We'll get to that. And third, you could kill them, the solution ultimately preferred. Here you've got a uh, boycott standing outside a Jewish shop saying, don't walk in, don't buy from Jews. Now, by the way, this is interesting. I went through the pages of the Stormer from 1933 to 1938 or so, when there were still a fair number of Jews in Germany. And one of the things the Nazis did is not only accuse Jews individually of things, but of accuse Germans. By the way, we almost find ourselves using the Nazi language. Remember that Jews are German citizens sometimes for millennia, uh, but for purposes of, we're almost using the Nazi terminology. But in any event, the argument was that the, uh, there were cowardly, ignorant Germans who supported the Jews. And one of the things Stryker's readers could do was to keep lists of their neighbors. And these would be printed that either be put on poster boards in the town or else printed in the store room. And I counted 6,000 individual names of Germans in the Stormer who were there because they'd done things like tip their hat to a Jewish neighbor, played cards with a Jewish neighbor, given an old Jewish woman next door a ride to the doctor. Any of these things could get you written up in the Stormer, and this had consequences. Uh, sometimes they couldn't identify one. One of my quote-unquote favorite examples was a picture of a woman who was buying from a Jewish store. They didn't know who she was. Well, they printed it in the Stormer. And a couple of weeks later, the Stormer got a letter from the woman's husband saying, hey, listen, I travel a lot. I didn't realize my wife was uh, shopping here. You can bet I'll have a talk to her when I get back. Now, what's interesting here is that you did not have to be passionately anti-Semitic to be influenced by this. Now, okay, I would like to believe 
I really would like to believe that if it's 1937 and I'm in Germany and I'm walking past a Jewish store and these guys are standing there, I would really like to believe I would go in anyway. I would like to believe it. And maybe I would. But I've never been in that situation, have I? I've never taken the risk of walking past these guys knowing that it might cost me my job. Okay? And so even if Germans were not necessarily believing everything, if they believed 10 or 15%, nonetheless this kind of threat would drive them further and further away from Jews. My earlier example, the dog hurts because you know the dog. 10 million people don't. Okay? If the Nazis beat up your next door neighbor, who you've known for 10 years, However, if that person is moved out of town, disappeared, you know, who cares? It's not that you don't care, but you've got other things to worry about. And so what the Nazis are doing is increasingly splitting the German Jews from the rest of the population through this kind of intimidation. So you made life as difficult as possible for Jews, and then you could get them out of the country. Now, about half of the German Jewish population was able to leave Germany before World War II began, maybe 300,000 or so, okay? Uh, because the Nazis weren't engaged in mass murder yet. Individual murders, yes, but not mass murder. Uh, and so the Nazis were quite happy to see Jews leaving and they did a variety of things uh, to support that. But, but, then something happened. World War II. Now, World War II was a problem for the Nazis in several different ways. First, although they had been on their way to solving what they called the Jewish problem in Germany, suddenly they were in Poland with millions of Jews. And then they invaded Russia and other places. So suddenly, Germany had a whole lot more Jews than it ever had before. What do you do about that? Well, it's war. Most German Jews have been gotten out of most neighborhoods either sent to camps or concentrated in ghettos in the larger cities, okay? People don't have much contact, and they don't really know what's going on in other countries or dis distant parts. And the Nazis have this problem of millions of Jews. At this point, annihilation begins to become the reasonable from the point of view solution. Now, this has been inherent in Nazism from the beginning. I cited the quotation by Adolf Hitler. Here's another. This is 1927, before the Nazis took power. The poison king, the, the king of the, op, uh, the uh, oaks here. And you've got a Nazi, and you can't see it very clearly, but what he's doing is he's pumping poison gas into the roots of the tree to kill the rats. And the rats, of course, are the Jews. So even in 1927, the Nazis are thinking, no, nobody's thinking mass annihilation at this stage but the roots are being laid. This is a cartoon from 1933, a few months after Hitler took power. Revenge, note the word revenge. The Jews had done supposedly all of these terrible things to Germany, and so the Nazi is pushing the Jew off the cliff. Uh, go, you evil spirit, where you wanted me to be. The beginning of the argument that the Jews had been out to destroy Germany, so in this case it was just self-defense for the Nazis to go after the Jews. But this is 1933. The Nazis still are not thinking about mass murder. I don't think they were. I think they had to talk themselves into it as well as uh, the rest of the population. Now we move to 1939. In January of 1939, Hitler gave one of his famous long speeches. And in that speech, he said, if international financial jewelry should, should succeed once again in plunging the peoples into a world war, then the result will not be the victory of the Jews, but rather the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. January 1939, before the war. And this did not attract too much attention at the time. Because again, nobody thought he really meant killing all the Jews. In fact, the speech was viewed as a calming speech by the stock markets went up the next day because Hitler talked about the German demand for colonies. Now remember in the fall, he'd taken over you know, Czechoslovakia, the Munich Agreement and so forth. And he was making noises about Poland and so forth. But people seemed happy that he was talking about the colonies because that was a long way away and how was he gonna get there anyway? And people more or less ignored uh, this statement. Nobody really believed it. 
But, as I said, now we're, this was published in August of 1941 after the invasion of Russia. And the statement now meant a great deal of a different thing than it had in 1939. Now the destruction of European Jews can be perhaps thought more seriously. And in fact, the Holocaust was already beginning. Some of this is almost amusing if it weren't tragic. This is the cover to a mass Nazi brochure issued in 1941. And the gentleman there with the typewriter was an American Jew who published a book at his own expense in a small edition called Germany Must Perish. He argued, self published, that Germany had plunged the world into war twice, and the only solution was to make it impossible, and the best way to do that would be to sterilize all Germans, because killing them would be barbaric. Okay? Nobody in the US took it seriously. A copy got to Germany. They loved it because it suggests exactly what their point was. The Jews were out to destroy Germany. It was only self-defense from the Nazi point of view. So this was issued in a huge uh, edition, getting on to lots of German households. You had signs like this. This was a poster, and they issued a huge number of these posters. This was a weekly poster. All over German schools, factories, public places, and so forth. And all of the same goal destroying Germany. Germany must be destroyed, according to the London newspaper. Germany must forever be destroyed, and so forth. So, again, people are seeing this all over Germany, blazing vivid posters. And it doesn't only happen in this. It just was a follow up to that original brochure. When you see this sign, dot, dot, dot. This was after the institution of the Yellow Star for the Jews remaining at large in Germany. And it showed up in other areas. For example, you had posters. The Jew, you know, beginning of the war, the one who lengthens the war, the curtains being torn aside, the fists of the angry peoples of the world are being raised. Or he is guilty of the war. It's the Jewish fault. Okay? So what the Nazis are arguing is that it is a war of self-defense. They are not out to destroy the Jews. The Jews are out to destroy Germany, and they are only taking self-defense. So, for example, Hitler started making explicit references in a broad sense to destroying uh, the Jews. So, for instance, Hitler said in 1942, I wish to avoid making hasty prophecies, but this war will not end as the Jews imagine, namely the extermination of the European Aryan peoples. Instead, the result of this war will be the annihilation of Jewry. Now, Hitler is saying this, and it's appearing in every newspaper in the country. Okay? There are lots of other... Here's Goebbels. This is Goebbels in one of his articles, which again was widely read. One of our enemies calls for the dissolution of a military and economic unity. Another for the dividing us into smaller states. A third for birth control and the reduction of our population to 10 million. A fourth for the sterilization of every one of us under the age of 60. But they all agree on one thing. In the firm resolve that if they once again defeat Germany, we must this time be crushed, destroyed, exterminated, and wiped out. So you see the argument, okay? Germany is only defending itself against the nefarious actions of the Jews. And at this stage, most Jews in Germany have been removed from visibility, taken out of small towns, concentrated, and so forth. And it's like the distant people in China. People don't know what happened anymore. And there's a law. There are other things to worry about. It's easy to forget about the Jews and think, well, they probably had it coming anyway. Films. This is, if you really want some disgusting material, you can look at this. Uh, it's available on the internet these days, YouTube. Uh, the Nazis put out a series of anti-Semitic films. They generally, by the way, put out films that didn't have a huge amount of propaganda content. Uh, because they found that people wouldn't pay good money for bad propaganda. So a lot of German films from the period could still be shown today, not, not this one. Okay? Uh, and this basically was a story based very loosely on historical events. A new uh, ruler needs money, he calls in the Jews, uh, the Jew corrupts the place, seduces the women and so forth, and he's finally hung at the end of the movie and the film says, uh, this may be, be a warning in the future so that our race will remain pure and so forth. This film was the best they could do. It had the top stars. It was a box office success. 
and it was shown to SS troops, among other things, in the East uh, to arouse them to greater hatred against the Jews. Now, this looks like a lot of words, and it is, but it indicates the extent to which the Nazis were interested, even in 1943. This is dated May of 1943. Most of their killing of the Holocaust is pretty well done by now, but the Nazis are worried that the Germans are not as anti-Semitic as they should be. This was a weekly newsletter for magazine editors. Every magazine editor got this. And this one, the anti-Jewish special edition, the goal, an anti-Jewish periodical press. There are 32 pages, if you're really curious, it's a full translation of my website, okay? But it's a summary of anti-Semitic arguments. In small print, it goes through every evil thing that the Jews allegedly have done. And magazine editors are instructed to put as much anti-Semitism in every article as possible. Now they say, don't always hit people over the head with it. You know, sometimes it can be just an article on forestry and a forestry journal, and you say, of course, Jews are never involved in forestry or something like that. You can make it subtle. You can make it subtle. But as many articles as possible, and this is 1943, they're still at it. They're still worried that Germans aren't Semitic, anti-Semitic enough. I've looked at a few German magazines, and quite a few of them, actually. Uh, here's an example, for instance. This is, uh, I think, uh, July, June. This is one of the Nazis' supposed humor magazines, and they followed instructions. Here's the cover, the Jewish uh, polyp or octopus with its arms around you know, Uncle Sam and uh, the British and the Russians and the Chinese. The Jews are behind all kinds of things. Or a little later in the war, you had cartoons like this. You've got this awful looking beast carrying a club. It's got you know, the uh, murder and a bomb. You've got this Russian star. You've got the Union Jack. You've got, and of course, the Star of David in yellow on the head. The argument that the Jews are going out to destroy Germany. It's the only solution to kill. I mean, seriously, this, this is what the Nazis said. I, the, the, OK, one of the more hidden uh, aspects of the Nazi propaganda at, uh, system was a system of speakers that went to every part of the country. A small agricultural village of 100 people would get a Nazi speaker, and they had to be trained. Here he is from 1943, after what we just saw, what speakers were told to say in meetings throughout Germany. Either the Jew, by the way, the terminology is interesting. They preferred the Jew rather than the Jews, because, of course, all Jews were part of this vast evil conspiracy. And so one Jew was as bad as the other. She could say the Jew, because they were a corporate entity out to no good. But either the Jew will exterminate us, or we will exterminate the Jew. As terrible as this alternative is, we did not bring the idea into the life of the nations. Rather, world Jewry did. It's a defensive war. It's the Jews' fault from the Nazi point of view. And remember, this becomes more plausible to Germans at the time because they're being bombed, they're starting to be driven back. And Germans are beginning to worry a little bit about what might happen. <coughs> now, the question is, how much did Nazis, Germans, believe this? And I said before, they didn't have to believe all of it. They had to believe at least enough of it to make them suspicious about Jews. And there are a couple of ways of looking at this. Some of you will remember uh, Eric Goldhagen's book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, which the character, caricature of the argument that just about all Germans were happy to help kill Jews. That's a bit of a caricature. But I think he overdid it. I think the percentage of Germans who were actually willing to individually kill Jews was relatively small enough to do the deed. Most of the Germans, I think, were somewhat indifferent. They were able to close their eyes. We all do that. We ignore things that are too unpleasant, right? We, we can close our eyes. And the Germans, of course, had a war going on. And as one of them, Fritz Sturm, one of the more prominent German historians, put it this way, he said, Germans knew enough to know they didn't want to know anymore. Germans knew enough to know they didn't want to know anymore. They had seen the material you've seen and much more of it. They had heard Hitler talking about the annihilation of the Jews. But no, by the way, Hitler's statements were always in general. You never saw a picture in the evening news in Germany saying, today we killed 100,000 Jews in Poland. Uh-uh. They never got specific. They never helped to see that dead dog in the middle of the street. There was always the 12 million dead people 
in Peking, okay? And so Germans were able to close their eyes to what was going on. Someone else put it this way. There was a hint of a possibility. And you see that it was there, right? It takes a lot of people to kill all those people. And they came back on leave, and they sent pictures. Germans knew enough to know they didn't want to know any more. One of the former presidents of Germany, Richard von Weizsäcker, said this some years back. There were many ways of not burdening one's conscience, of shunning responsibility, looking away, keeping mum. When the unspeakable truth of the Holocaust then became known at the end of the war, all too many of us claimed that they had not known anything about it or even suspected anything. But Ratchiker doesn't believe it. He was there. He doesn't believe it. And I doubt if many of us do either. But Germans were able to close their eyes. Now, it would be nice to believe that we've learned the lesson of the Holocaust. It would be very nice to believe that. But if you think about it, far more than six million people have been killed in the years since World War II for reasons of race, religion, ethnicity, and so forth. Think of the long and bloody record of the last years. Think of this, the wars between India and Pakistan. Think of places like Biafra in Africa. Think of Rwanda. Think of minor uh, piles of bodies like uh, Northern Ireland, places most of us may not have thought much about, East Timor, and on and on and on. Huge numbers of people have been killed and are being killed today around the world through techniques very similar to what we've seen here. Well, perhaps a little more refined, perhaps using some more different language, but also perhaps not. Some material just as vivid as this is circulating around the world in various places. And so it would be nice to believe that we learned the lesson of the Holocaust, but I do not think there's ever been a time in human history in which it hasn't been possible that one group of us angry enough at another group to be willing to kill. Certainly there's no good evidence that we've overcome that uh, today. So, what do we do? I wish I had a nice simple solution. I really wish I did. Uh, I don't. However, however, I think the best I suggest, and this is something I think many of you already do, is to act where we can. It's interesting that the Nazis had difficulty when they did things that aroused popular opposition. In 1941, they began a campaign of euthanasia, killing people who were old and sick and so forth. When did that get out? People were outraged. The famous case of Bishop von Gallen in Münster stood up on a pulpit and said, a Christian nation does not kill people because they are old or sick. The Nazis thought about arresting and executing them, but it was too popular. They didn't dare do it. They didn't stop the program, but they greatly slowed it down. Because even a totalitarian state cannot ignore the wishes of the vast majority of the population. About the same time, the Holocaust was building up. Germans didn't complain very much there. I don't think mass German protests would have stopped it, but it would have made it a lot more difficult. And it would have saved individual lives. Uh, some of you will have been to places like Yad Vashim, the Avenue of the Righteous Gentiles, right? How many, just out of curiosity, how many of you have been there? And, and you, yeah, okay. Memorials to people who risked their own lives and sometimes lost them to preserve the lives of Jews, and not only Jews, but sometimes other people who the Nazis were after as well. We all have that opportunity. We can take the step. We're not going to be hauled off and shot by the Nazis, but we're sometimes afraid to do it. I guess one of my favorite examples is the anti-black jokes in this country. There are all kinds of them when I grew up. Okay? Now they're still there, but people are reluctant to say them, right? Because if I tell you a racist joke, you're going to look at me like, what's wrong with you? Okay? A kind of social pressure. We have that ability ourselves. When we hear somebody else being you know, demean for whatever reason, we have the ability to say, I'm sorry. I disagree with that. Okay? We have that ability. I don't know about you. I'm a coward sometimes. I've, had, I've, I've avoided opportunities to say that. Sometimes I've had the courage to do it. We all have that opportunity. And that at least is something we can do. Because this kind of hatred, this kind of propaganda, depends on 
among other things. It depends on a variety of things, but it depends on people not standing up and speaking against it, as Richard von Weizsäcker said. That's one thing we can do. There may be more, but at least we can do that. This is not encouraging material, but it's true. And it's one of the reasons why gatherings like this are so important, to remind us not only of what happened in Germany, but what is happening, as some of your other lectures will do, today around the planet. Let us each do what we can, when we can. Thank you.